Good morning. I'm Katie Lewis with the Chamber for Greater Chapel Hill Carborough, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the Economic Development Forum. Today's forum is part of our 2022 Critical Issues series, which includes quarterly forums that feature discussions on timely topics related to our economy, economic development, public policy, and local elections. Before we get the program started, just a few housekeeping items. First, as, uh, as far as staffing for today's Zoom discussion, I'll serve as your host and monitor the chat for any questions or comments, so please feel free to post them throughout the program. Uh, my colleague Ori St. Germain is on technology. If you need any support, please uh, hit him up. And then Aaron Nelson will serve as your moderator. As you've probably noticed, your line was muted when you joined this meeting, and we ask that you remain muted for the program, but please do share your video if you're comfortable doing so. We love to see your smiling faces. Today's discussion will be recorded and shared through our YouTube channel, and we'll send you the link in our follow-up email um, within a couple days after the event. This forum, like many of our forums, is free for chamber members. If you're not a chamber member, but are interested in learning more, drop a note in the chat and a chamber staff member will be sure to follow up. Today's forum and the entire 2022 Critical Issues Series is coordinated by the Chamber's Government Affairs Committee and the Chair of the Government Affairs Committee, Betsy Brucker-Harris, would like to bring you welcome. Betsy is the IT Project Manager for Armacell, a global company that invented flexible foam and manufactures innovative insulation solutions that conserve energy. Armacell has 300 patents, 3,000 employees, and 24 facilities around the world, including their head office, for the Americas in Chapel Hill and a manufacturing facility in Mebane. Betsy? Thank you, Katie, and good morning, everyone. I apologize for my lack of video. I'm having some technical difficulties this morning, but I hope you can hear me. On behalf of the two dozen volunteers that serve on the Government Affairs Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Economic Development Forum. It's a joy for me to serve on the Chamber's Government Affairs Committee and to help coordinate these forums. In addition to these forums, our committee convenes every month to discuss policy matters and to coordinate on the Chamber's collective advocacy on behalf of the local business community. We focus on developing the economy, the community, our workforce, and local businesses. If you're interested in getting involved, please let Katie or I know in the chat. We'd love to have you for the coming year. And I want to thank our five presenters today for taking the time to prepare presentations. I know we're all looking forward to learning about what economic development projects are underway and what we can expect going forward. With that, I hope everyone enjoys the program and back to you, Katie. Oh, thanks, Betsy. Well, now it's my pleasure to recognize our sponsors whose support makes today's forum and the entire series possible. First up, Durham Tech. Durham Tech is the community college that serves our workforce needs here in Orange County. They have a beautiful 20 acre, 40,000 square foot campus centrally located in Orange County near Hillsborough. With us today is Durham Tech President, J.B. Buxton. J.B., good to see you. Please bring welcome. Katie, great to see you on, on such a great, beautiful fall morning. I wanna uh, tell you how pleased we are to be sponsoring the forum. And at Durham Tech, we feel like our job is to connect the residents of Orange County and Durham County to the great opportunities and careers in this region. And we think it's our also our responsibility to connect our employers to the great talent we have in this region. I wanna make sure you know that as part of that mission, the Orange County commissioners in their last budget cycle has invested resources so we can expand that beautiful 20 acre, 40,000 square foot facility, another 15,000 square feet. So we can expand our commitment to the healthcare needs in the region, especially with the UNC hospital right across the street. We can do more in the skilled trades, more in biotech, more in areas that are critical to Orange County, IT and the like. I also want you to know, because many folks don't know this as well, that the, the commissioners invested in short-term workforce credential scholarships, don't usually have financial aid for that, but thanks to these commissioners, we have those for the residents of Orange County. And I tell you, they are going fast. This is a, a major interest of our colleagues across Orange County. And then finally, uh, I want to make sure you know, given this conversation, one thing that many people don't know about community colleges in North Carolina, and certainly about Durham Tech, which is one of the leaders among community colleges in North Carolina, we do a lot of customized training that supports area businesses and industry that are new and growing or needing custom training for their incumbent employees. So not new employees coming in through us, but their existing workers. 
and we appreciate the support of the state and the county to be able to do that. So Katie, really happy to be sponsoring today. Appreciate the great leadership in Orange County, and that includes a great chamber. Thank you. Uh, thanks, JB. Uh, we love partnerships with Durham Tech. Please lean on Durham Tech, everyone, if you need any support for employee uh, talent recruitment and retention and training services. Next up, SurfPro. SurfPro of South Durham and Orange County is a locally owned and operated business that provides commercial and residential fire and water cleanup and restoration services, as well as biohazard, trauma, and mold remediation services. Look no further than the flood damages in Florida that are happening right now, and you can understand the critical work that SurfPro does. They're there when you need them with 24-7 uh, emergency services. They're fast, highly trained, and use advanced tools, technology, and equipment. With us today is SurfPro's business development representative, Jim McNeely. Jim, good to see you. Please bring welcome. Thank you so much, Katie. The SurfPro of South Durham and County, your local restoration, mitigation, cleaning, and construction specialist is the chamber. The essential topics presented by experts in their fields fortify and enhance the thriving business community that makes Chapel Hill, Carborough, and the surrounding areas great. As we move forward, SurfPro of South Durham and Orange County is committed to giving back and supporting our neighbor businesses so that we can all excel in the months and years to come. We thank the chamber and its presenters for their diligence, preparation, hard work, and welcome all those in attendance today. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Jim. I want to acknowledge three other sponsors of this year's series uh, in today's forum, the Chapel Hill Media Group, Grub Properties, and the SBTDC. First, Chapel Hill Media Group, including 97.9 The Hill and Chapelboro.com. They are our local radio station and Chapel Hill's oldest, most reliable broadcaster. And Chapelboro.com is your local daily news source. Our community is so proud of them. They just swept the North Carolina Association of Broadcasters Awards. They earned the Station of the Year, the Radio Community Involvement, and the Aaron Keck got Personality of the Year. So remember to tune in to them uh, for your Tar Heel coverage game day and also their outstanding local election coverage. Also Grub Properties, you know Grub Properties through Glen Lennox, their historic community in the heart of Chapel Hill that's being reborn with unrivaled residential retail and class A office space. They're an active partner helping us reimagine and re-energize our downtown with their transformational 136, 137 East Franklin project. They're going to bring new lab um, and office space and um, feature the new innovation hub. Uh, we're proud to have them in our community and as sponsors of this series. And then finally, our supporting sponsor, the SBTDC, the Small Business Technology Development Center. This is a network of centers with professional staff who provide free and confidential business counseling for small and mid-sized businesses. It's an extension program of the UNC system. So it's funded in part by the US Small Business Administration. And there are SBTD centers um, at each of our UNC system campuses, including one here in Chapel Hill and another in Durham at NC Central. So if you need any help with your business, so think human resource management, financial planning, marketing, you name it, call them, make an appointment, email them, uh, and tap into that free and confidential support. Also, their regional director, Neil McTighe, is here on the uh, program today. So just chat them up if you want to, if you need any support. All right, now on to the program. As I mentioned before, our moderator today is our chamber president and CEO, Aaron Nelson. Aaron has led our chamber for more than 20 years, and so he's moderated a few of these economic development, development forums in his time. Aaron, over to you. Thanks, Katie. I really appreciate the energy that you bring to a morning meeting. There's just a delightfulness in how you are presenting that I just can't help but smile at. Thank you to our uh, sponsors uh, for helping underwrite, and y'all, we have a great set of panels. Uh, if you've been to a chamber function before, you know we're not going to be short on content. We're going to give you more uh, than you expected or maybe more than you asked for. So let's get started today. The purpose of our forum today is to look closely at economic development throughout the greater Chapel Hill, Carborough, and Orange County communities. We're going to unpack what's underway, why it matters, and what we can expect going forward. We're going to divide it into two segments. First, we're going to have five speakers delivered to you uh, prepared presentations. I may ask a question or two. We invite you to put a question in the chat. Um, but we're going to press through that content and then we're going to take a break and we'll use the balance of the time for a panel discussion and a Q&A with you all. You should have opportunity to ask 
uh, and get questions uh, answered. If you do have questions, again, you can post them uh, right there uh, in the chat and Katie and I will be following along with that. And Katie will help tee those up. So let's get to it. Our first speaker is the Director of Economic Development for Orange County, Steve Brantley. He has worked in economic development for more than 30 years, uh, more than 10 years of that in Orange County, where he has helped us recruit some incredible investors and local employers, including uh, the Japanese candy company, Morinaga. They make haichu. My favorite uh, is the uh, mango flavored one, although the apple, I think, is quite fabulous as well. Before Orange County, Steve worked with the North Carolina Department of Commerce, helping four different governors and five commerce secretaries recruit new businesses and industrial facilities throughout North Carolina. And he focused on Asia, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, China. He was a commercial banker. He served in the Navy. Steve, it is really good to see you. Uh, we're looking forward to your update on what's up with Orange County uh, regarding economic development. Uh, good morning, uh, Aaron, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, uh, to make a very uh, quick presentation. I uh, am not going to cover the broad responsibilities of Orange County, or even I don't have time to talk about all of economic development in Orange County, but I will try to give you uh, uh, an insight into what uh, are some of our most important uh, uh, activities at the moment. Um, next slide, please. Uh, please uh, look here at our core programs. The, the county's economic development programs reflect uh, Orange County Board of Commissioners' important social justice goal to ensure economic self-sufficiency for all of our residents. Uh, and here you can see that we focus on small business, which is uh, retention, expansion, and recruitment of small locally owned businesses larger business recruitment, uh, such as uh, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific, uh, Medline Industries, uh, Morinaga many years ago. Uh, we're generally trying to promote non-residential growth uh, in, in, in our economic development districts. Uh, our separate tourism and hospitality pro uh, promotion, which I'll talk about at the end of my comments, is another aspect of what we do. Uh, and that includes our Arts Commission uh, uh, organization. We provide uh, entrepreneurial startups in a, in a relationship with the town of Chapel Hill and UNC. We have a food incubator facility in Hillsboro. And then the Breeze Farm is, a, is an NC State owned property in Northern Orange County where people can go and, and uh, learn to farm. Uh, and we are a, a part of that operation. And then finally, agriculture and the local food suppliers uh, represent uh, another area of what we do. Next slide, Ari. We work with a lot of uh, people. Uh, here are some of our uh, key economic development partners that we frequently work with and rely upon for their respective expertise uh, and assistance. Of course, you can see uh, there are various state of North Carolina agencies, uh, also the NC Works organization, uh, which is a part of the Department of Commerce. We work with our major utilities, uh, also uh, closely with our towns of Carborough, Chapel Hill, Hillsboro uh, and even Mebane, because uh, part of Mebane uh, extends into Orange County. We work with Durham Technical Community College, both the, uh, the Durham campus and our very nice Hillsboro satellite campus. We work with UNC, both the university uh, and UNC Health. We work with nonprofits uh, such as Matt Gladick's uh, Chapel Hill Downtown Corporation uh, and the Launch Incubator and, and several others, uh, Empowerment, for example, that Dolores Bailey manages. And we certainly uh, work with our two uh, fine chambers of commerce, uh, Aaron's uh, Greater Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber, and then Kim Tassaro's uh, Hillsboro Chamber of Commerce. Next slide, Ari. I, I trust that most of you uh, know uh, the one quarter cent retail sales tax, which we uh, technically call Article 46. Uh, there's been a, a new development in that that I'll mention in a moment. Uh, uh, annual funds generated by Article 46 or the one quarter cent sales tax enable the majority of the county's various uh, economic development programs. Uh, and I do want to personally thank the Orange County Board of uh, County Commissioners uh, for their recent decision earlier this month to, to unanimously approve another 10 year renewal of these funds to mutually support uh, our two excellent public school systems uh, and further pursue a diversified local economy. Article 46 began 
uh, by being approved by voters in uh, late 2011. Uh, in the past 10 years, the county has been using uh, funds in a variety of man uh, manner just for economic development, uh, which I will, I, will, I will only talk about that area. Uh, currently, it generates about $4 billion a year. Uh, that, that $4 million is split between education uh, and economic development. And it was on September 6th that the Board of Commissioners uh, uh, approved a new resolution uh, for a new 10-year use of Article 46, uh, again, for education uh, and economic development. Uh, next slide, Ari. This chart just shows you over the initial 10 years, uh, the steady annual increase in Article 46 revenues, uh, which during the first 10 years provided $26.4 million. 50% of that, or $13.2 million of that amount, supplemented uh, the counties and our community support of our two public school systems. And this figure typically increases uh, every year uh, as our population grows and particularly in a, uh, a boom economy there. Next slide. Now, one of our most important programs, which supports our small locally owned businesses and farms, are our grant programs led by Assistant uh, Department Director Amanda Garner uh, in our Hillsborough office. Our Board of Commissioners are very proud of the success of our small business and agriculture grant programs and allocate annual funding to these programs. This chart shows that since 2015, when the grant programs began, the county has awarded over 400 grants, totaling more than $2.3 million to our local small businesses and, and farms. Essentially, the county is reinvesting that amount of money collected from Article 46 back in to our community. Uh, I would invite uh, anyone listening today or, or small businesses that you know of that could benefit from our grant program to visit our website or contact our office. Uh, and I and Amanda Garner uh, and Lindsay Herney in our office will make sure to get you uh, an application, the guidelines to, to, uh, to spread information. We are striving to increase the uh, success of this program uh, with our many uh, valued uh, minority and women-owned firms in Orange County. We've done great so far and we want to keep keep that track record uh, moving. Next slide, please. I'll take a moment to, to look at this map that shows the area along Interstate uh, 40 from Hillsborough West to the Alamance County line. Another aspect of Article 46 funding is to provide critical water and sewer infrastructure uh, in the county's economic development district districts. This map shows the recent development projects from Hillsboro and West toward the city of Mebane. Currently, there are at least five developers of light industrial, logistics distribution, and commercial business parks, uh, or business park operations that are now active uh, in this area. They either own property, have property under contract, uh, have already been uh, rezoned uh, to move forward, or in, in several cases are already doing the construction uh, of their activity. Uh, as each of these projects come online, this region will grow in importance as an employment center and as a significant tax base uh, for, for the county. So let me briefly uh, just touch upon several of uh, the items here. You, you can see to the upper left of the map uh, our newer industries that have either uh, announced or expanded Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, is is the most recent uh, company that is still under construction. That is at site number three. Across the interstate is the large ABB company that made a large expansion uh, in the past year, and then Morinaga and many of the other industries in this area. Uh, all of these companies and future companies to come here will represent uh, a significant uh, need for both workers and skilled uh, uh, experience. And so the, our partnership with the Durham Technical Community College and Dr. Buxton is going to be critical to help train Orange County residents for a variety of skill levels to work uh, in these companies. So let me uh, now focus uh, to site number one at the uh, south of Hillsborough, 
Uh, this is part of the Hillsboro Economic Development District. It is the location of a uh, of the 160 acre research triangle logistics park that has already been approved for zoning uh, is is anticipating up to 2.2 to 2.4 million square feet uh, of development uh, in that area, uh, and that would be uh, a significant uh, economic boom for the town of Hillsboro. If you move to the center of the map, uh, site number two, uh, we have a Minnesota developer, Opidan, that owns 100 acres there. Uh, they plan to build an, about 900,000 square feet on that site. Uh, a little bit west of it is, is another developer, Williams Development Group, out of Winston-Salem, that plans to put uh, 900,000 square feet uh, on their property. Then near the Medline building, uh, there is a developer named Exeter, a very large developer that plans to build about 600 or 700,000 square feet. And then uh, sites three and four represent an Ohio developer named Nyer that first became active in North Carolina in Wake County. Uh, they now have several sites in Orange County uh, and they plan to have about 1.6 million square feet of, of development there. And they are the the location of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Their second building that is uh, almost completed, uh, I understand already has a tenant that has signed a lease uh, for it. Uh, and there is other activity here. So this is uh, where I spend uh, a lot of my time uh, in, in supporting this level of activity in the county's uh, economic development districts. Next slide. This uh, just briefly shows you companies that have located here since 2019, uh, up, up through the most current company, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, these new and expanding businesses uh, throughout the county are now seeking employees for a variety of skill levels and work experience. Here are just a, a few to include Wegmans and Weldot, which were recruited to the town of Chapel Hill uh, in a uh, excellent partnership uh, between the, the town of Chapel Hill and Orange County. Here you can see that since 2019, uh, nearly 1,700 new jobs, $339 million uh, in taxable investment, and 2 million square feet of new construction uh, has already been uh, announced, and those jobs are now uh, being uh, filled. Uh, let me just say that, that ABB, uh, most people would not know this, was formerly the GE plant. AB, ABB is a Swiss-Swedish company. They are the single largest publicly owned company in North in, in Orange County, and they will have 1,000 employees at full production, and their average wage is 70 to $71,000. Medline Industries, which has a very large uh, distribution building uh, in the county, is, is, a, is a very uh, renowned uh, supplier of medical products to hospitals and EMS stations and nursing homes. And then Thermo Fisher Scientific is going to be a life science light manufacturing company supplying pipettes to support COVID testing and other any future pandemic testing uh, to the U.S. government and, and other uh, organizations. Next slide, please. And let me conclude with two slides. Uh, and, and give a, a salute to our affiliated uh, Visitors Bureau led by Lori Policelli and her very talented staff. Their work is funded by hotel occupancy tax revenues with the town of Chapel Hill being an especially key partner uh, in that financial uh, support. The Visitors Bureau has been very busy and successful in the past year with new marketing activities to include creating new uh, planning guides, uh, putting money into new uh, media campaigns, and, and most, uh, they're most proud, I'm sure, of opening their new Visitors Bureau. Uh, and I would encourage anyone to go and visit the Visitors Bureau uh, and see it if, if you have not uh, already been there and see the uh, James Taylor uh, attraction that they have. And then my last slide, Ari. And the county is, is now seeing a very encouraging business recovery and a rebound in tourism and hospitality spending and revenues compared to 2022 and 2021 severe slump caused by the, the COVID pandemic. These metrics on this chart reveal the positive recovery that's now occurring in our local hospitality sector. 
The sector is very important because it employs over 1,500 people in Orange County, has a $53 million annual pay raise. Uh, and, and you can see some of these metrics here about the very significant increase uh, in visitor spending uh, over the, the COVID years. Uh, and so hats off to the Visitors Bureau uh, in their work here. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. And for your leadership over the last decade, we had a quick question about whether most of those facilities are distribution or warehouses or manufacturing. Can you quickly describe what's coming into those spaces? Uh, thank you so much, because I myself was going to proactively mention that. Uh, let's look at the Nyer uh, Business Park on West Hen Road and Buckhorn Road. Uh, Nyer originally envisioned two buildings that they would have called spec distribution or light manufacturing buildings for lease. Uh, and as the site work began, the Thermo Fisher Scientific Company came and told Nyer, told us that is where they wanted to be. And so what on paper it looked like was going to be a distribution logistics building is now going to be life science manufacturing. And I see that trend continuing as, as any of these business parks in Orange County uh, come online, that you, you may land what Alamance County landed a year ago, which was the $262 million UPS distribution facility paying $65,000 a year, or you may land uh, something like a Thermo Fisher or, or, or a, a similar advanced manufacturing life science company that would be expanding out of the Research Triangle Park uh, in that regard. Super helpful. Steve, thank you very much. We're going to move to, and we'll come back for a panel conversation, over to uh, Chapel Hill and Dwight Bassett. Dwight is our next presenter. He is the Director of Economic Development and Parking Services for the town of Chapel Hill. Uh, he has more than 30 years of experience developing projects uh, that lead employment and tax base growth every day. As you guys know, Dwight is working hard to make sure that Chapel Hill is open to business. I really like that branding of open to business, and we're grateful to have his depth of knowledge and expertise. Dwight was a former small business owner himself, has substantial experience in different communities, and he's bringing that wealth of knowledge uh, into our community. We are grateful for his partnership, his leadership, and a general good spirit <laughs> at all times, uh, sometimes even in the face of uh, community headwinds uh, on occasion. As you know, this community can sometimes push back against um, uh, the change in the, the physical appearance. Uh, so Dwight, thank you for continuing to work hard uh, for our community and its economy. Y'all, this is Dwight Bassett. Mm, Dwight, you are muted at the moment. Thank you. Sorry about the mute. Um, and would you go to full screen mode so that um, clicking correct. it? Is it in full screen mode on your screen? We are seeing the slides on the side, which is okay if you're not able to get it to full screen. Uh, that is, unless you're going to have some notes underneath, which says things like uh, <laughs> things that you might not want us to read over your shoulder. I don't know why it's not doing full screen. There we go. Yay. Sorry about that. So we still do not. I'm sorry. We still still don't see it in full screen. And I think that may be because you have two screens in front of you. If you want to, when you go back to share screen, you just share this one. But you also can proceed just like this. Uh, we can see it. I don't understand. It usually shares. I apologize. I've never had no this problem. before. Aaron, Ori has the presentation, I believe, on standby. If you want to, we can just have Ori. So here's what I would unshare your full screen and then reshare. And maybe that'll solve our problem. And now try your button. Now, let's just go ahead with it as it is. I think we can see it just fine and we'll send it around to folks afterwards. Sorry about that. So thank you for having me this morning. We're really excited. A lot of good things going on. I apologize for the PowerPoint issue. 
um, but still lots of good things to share. Um, over the last few years, a few accomplishments that we're pleased about over 800 new jobs from entrepreneurship, recruitment of Well Dot Incorporated with 400 new jobs. We just are doing a CEO series of interviews and just interviewed him. And they are now have hired 100 employees and are working on their expansion plans. Uh, Wegmans with 400 plus jobs paying uh, pretty much above living wage. Uh, NC Bio coming into downtown, East Rosemary redevelopment, and over a billion in uh, new tax base facilitated uh, through our office. Creation of the Revive Recovery Plan and subsequent community investment. And Merit Properties is set to break ground on November 9th to build the first flex space in Chapel Hill's history, which is pretty exciting. Some of the framework from our Revive Recovery Plan includes resilient economy, resilient place, and resilient people. And that is the way we invested in that plan. And we're pretty excited about the output um, that we're seeing uh, from that initiative. So some of our key goals are to continue to implement the revive goals while we're coming out of the pandemic. We're, I don't believe that we're fully out. There's still a lot of issues, whether it's employment, hiring employees, or uh, supply chain issues. And we want to make sure that we do whatever we can to continue to support our business community. Um, some of our other goals include marketing and communication, increase inquiries to fill new office space and job creation. Uh, business facilitation and ombudding to help improve our reputation as a destination for doing business, strengthening our town and gown relation, and implementing our downtown together plan, which is a joint initiative between the town and the university to help create an innovation hub in downtown. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, later on. So next, I talk about our complete complete community strategy that we are currently working on. And a lot of people say, why is economic development working on a complete community strategy specifically when it's about how and where to build housing uh, to meet the needs of a future Chapel Hill? Well, many years ago, you probably don't remember because it's passed, but we had an office supply problem and now have over 650,000 square foot of office supply uh, entitled and ready to be built. And now we need to make sure that we've got a location to house those employees when we recruit those companies. And so we're working to create a strategy that shows us uh, how and where we build that housing in the future uh, and in what context. Some of the hard truths that the consultant has brought out uh, in this process is that Chapel Hill is already an exclusive place and we know we desire to be an inclusive community. Number two, no one is happy with the planning process or planning outcomes. So we need to look at how we get beyond project by project planning to community building. And number three, Chapel Hill has a development, uh, a difficult urban form to remediate. Uh, while we don't wanna see it this way, uh, a lot of our growth in past decades has been somewhat of a suburban form, but yeah, we talk about being a place that you can bike and uh, walk and take transit. And there are elements of that that we need to go back and help refocus so that we have a, uh, a better urban form in the future to support those activities. The transformative change is possible in Chapel Hill. The town of Chapel Hill is interested in identifying shared interests around a new approach to housing that clarifies where and how to build inclusive, sustainable, complete communities and an economically competitive town. So this is just some of the uh, framework of who we've been talking to. Um, part of the goal is to build a uh, sort of a Congress of people interested in seeing positive change and development in Chapel Hill. So we've been interviewing citizens uh, that can assist council in helping to champion and move this uh, initiative forward. And we're pretty excited with the leadership we're seeing emerge in our community to help us succeed at this initiative. So the elements of a complete community include diverse housing, transit, active transportation, public realm investment, mixed use, green spaces, retail, and employment. And so as we move forward, one of the goals of the complete community strategy is to select a pilot project, put a shovel in the ground to show council's interest in uh, implementing this and moving it forward as quickly as possible. And when we look at pilot projects, we'll be looking at ones that can fulfill those key objectives and anatomies um, to make sure that we're uh, moving forward uh, in a different way. 
Next, we have our strategy for downtown Chapel Hill Innovation District. We're pretty excited about this partnership between the university and uh, downtown Chapel Hill um, partnership. And sort of the goals and metrics of this is to continue to revitalize downtown, create a better front door for UNC, and increase jobs and tax revenue. And we think we're on a really good path and are excited about what this means. Uh, looking forward uh, to the future of East Rosemary, uh, you can see um, the parking deck here, the Life Sciences building that was approved by council last year, the existing 136, 137 building here, and a new hotel being built around the former town hall site. And we're pretty excited about what that means. Another map just showing those same things. And this one includes the Porthole Alley redevelopment. We feel this is an entire district of uh, great improvements that will transform and create a uh, hopefully a, a 18 month, a 18 hour downtown, 12 months out of the year and not just uh, 10 or 12 hours a day and for nine months when the students are here. So sort of a timeline for things that are happening. Most of you are aware that um, the 136, 137 building that's going to be an innovation hub is being um, rehabilitated now uh, and will be close to being complete by the end of this year and begin to open up in different phases next year. Uh, we are constructing the parking deck and it will be open next year also. And then other projects will follow uh, after that. So this is the Innovation Hub. It's seven stories, 118,000 square feet. Will be future home of UNC's programming space uh, for innovation, which is about 20,000 square feet. Launch Chapel Hill will be based there and NC Bio Labs will also be there. Uh, we're pretty excited about that anchoring this entire district as a uh, first major investment. Um, then the University Gateway Porthole Alley, a part of this partnership with the university is to improve the front door of people coming to UNC. And we're pretty excited about all the initiatives that we have going on to beautify and improve the face of East Franklin Street and East Rosemary so that it is a more welcoming uh, environment. The Life Sciences Building, which was entitled by council last year, 240,000 square foot, seven story lab and office building. And for you that do not know, we have been talking about lab space for well over a decade now and have been in competition with RTP when it came to um, retaining companies from genome and life sciences at UNC. And this will give us that opportunity to be competitive and to retain some of that growth and development that comes off that campus. Uh, downtown parking deck, uh, pretty excited about this. Uh, it's 230 net new parking spaces. Most people think it's a, a giant new parking deck, but because we're combining uh, the Wallace deck, the previous CVS 136, 137 deck, uh, and some surface parking, uh, we're replacing parking, but we're also providing 100 spaces to support the university's investment in Porthole Alley, which is pretty important because that investment could not have happened had they not had a place to park. Uh, apartments are proposed at 101 East Rosemary. We're pretty excited about this because it can help fulfill our desire to be a live workplace shop uh, downtown so that people who work in those office buildings and lab spaces can live and walk across the street to work every day. Uh, the Elements Hotel, which is behind the former town hall on West Columbia, pretty excited about this, an additional uh, reason to draw visitors in our downtown and we think an important element uh, as we move forward. Some of the benchmarks and measurements for economic development that we agreed this spring with council is that we would look at the net new office space constructed every year, percentage of that office space occupied post-construction, new jobs created as a component of our economic development work, office and retail occupancy townwide, and implementation goals achieved of the uh, downtown together plan. And with that, I will quit sharing my screen. I'll be glad to take uh, any questions you might have. Why your uh, capacity to quickly send us through that is tremendous. We have one question. Like, will we be able to see that presentation? Uh, yes, we'll both share this video. Um, and I think we can also attach the presentations, convert them into PDFs um, and send those out to y'all. Um, we had a question also, someone want to make sure they heard you right, or maybe you can explain when you say want the goal of changing us from a suburban environment to a more urban environment, can you say what that means? 
Well, we've built a lot of neighborhoods over the last 30 or 40 years. They're not interconnected. We don't have a natural grid. We operate off arterial streets. And in order for an urban forum to flourish in Chapel Hill and to be able to have better connectedness, one of the things that's coming out of this planning is uh, using a trail system to interconnect a lot of those areas and so that people can think about using e-bikes as a form of transportation versus just their car transit. Um, and so it's it's making sure that that it's better connected and it's a better face of um, urban interaction and also districts of uh, connectedness so that you can go a quarter or half mile to great other areas, whether it's to buy groceries or whatever else, using those connected trails or existing road systems so that uh, each neighborhood is supported uh, with its basic needs from an urban standpoint. But, I, and, but if there's fear of a urban form and folks think that we're going to look like downtown, no, uh, I don't know, uh, with 20 story high rises, you're talking by urban form, you mean walkable, bikeable, connected transit yes. works rather than uh, suburban, sprawling. Okay. That's exactly that fair. What are the questions? Uh, are there any other questions posted before we jump to our next speaker? Nope, you can move right along. I haven't seen All you. right, all right. Let's jump to Matt Gladick, who's going to put a little more color on some of this downtown work. Um, Matt is the executive director of the Chapel Hill Downtown Partnership. He is a planner by training, passionate about walkable, bikeable, small urban environments is what is included in the introduction we have prepared. Uh, so much so uh, that he has uh, tattooed what he believes to be the most ideally planned city uh, on his no, Arm. no, like not, ne some not necessarily the most ideally planned city. Just you okay. know, a very a one close to his heart ideally planned. And if you want to know about Dwight Bassett and what he has tattooed, different conversation, different time. Um, let is <laughs> so again more than you thought you were going to get this morning. This is Matt Gladick. Please bring your magic uh, to this presentation. We're so grateful for what you're doing for our downtown. Morning, everyone. I'm going to try to move quickly to make up some time. And since Dwight talks so much about great things happening downtown, I have less that I need to talk about. Um, the mission of the Downtown Chapel Hill Partnership is to be a champion and advocate for Downtown Chapel Hill through programming, marketing, business support, and community building. I'm going to be talking about just a couple of these this morning. Just to make sure everyone understands, this is our boundary for downtown. Um, it is mostly the commercial area in downtown and those uh, areas where it kind of gerrymanders is making sure that we're cutting out single family housing that doesn't uh, benefit from our services. Uh, one of the big things that we've worked on with economic development, thanks to partnership with the university and the town of Chapel Hill, is trying to improve our um, our sidewalk and public spaces through planters uh, and other beautification things. This is still a work in progress. Um, supply chain has slowed this down a little bit more than we wanted, but um, we're, we're making some good improvements here and have spent uh, almost $100,000 in improving the infrastructure for our planters in, over the past two years. Downtown Together has been an incredibly important uh, partnership and collaboration between the town and the university. I know Cheryl Waddell is on this call and um, Cheryl has been an incredible partner as of course, obviously Dwight and the county and the chamber have been as well. The future development that Dwight has gone through is going to be incredibly important. Um, one thing that I wanna highlight here is you know the Columbia Hotel, um, the Element Hotel will give us about another 150 hotel rooms, which is incredibly important for um, just the overall health of downtown because those people come to spend money in ways that normal residents don't always do. And our lab space and other office space that is planned right now is going to double the amount of class A office space that we have in currently in downtown, which is to Dwight's point, really gonna help with making us a 12 month um, downtown. Since July 1 of 2021, uh, we've had 14 businesses open with only six businesses closing. Um, we've got seven more signed leases that have not um, uh, have not opened yet. That includes, um, but it's not limited to, the Crumble at 140 West, which is a fancy cookie shop, um, Raising Canes, 
and uh, uh, and the IPOR Dios and the former Kipo space um, and a few other things that aren't quite ready to um, to publish. Uh, we also had a bunch of business that have expanded over this time, um, including brand wines, uh, Purple Bowl, um, Prolog, um, the school kids moving into the Spindle bar next door, um, and Spicy Nine um, expanding during the pandemic. So that's a good sign of our strengths. Uh, people can sometimes talk about the um, number of closures in downtown. We've got about a 200 um, street level re, um, customer facing businesses. So, you know, we have a over a 95% retention rate of our businesses, which is really strong. Our vacancy rate right now is um, just under uh, 10%, um, a little bit more than 9%. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind with when you walk downtown, you might see things that are empty right now that looks higher than this uh, 9%, but Supply chain issues have caused a huge backup in people being able to uh, move into space that they have leased. So I don't have, I've got a lot of stuff that I can't lease out again because it's already been taken by somebody. Um, I won't talk about this for too long. Um, again, I'm trying to move very quickly, so I apologize and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I presented some of this data in our, uh, this, the Chamber's State of the Community event. And thank you again, Aaron, for providing us a little time. Over the past 12 months, we've had more people in downtown than we've ever had in the past five years. Uh, this is data that we get from cell phone data from a company called Placer.ai that we purchased from. Um, but we have returned to pre-pandemic levels and more, and things are going really well, whereas other cities that have rely more on office space and people that are working from home haven't recovered as quickly. So as we look at this, um, I think one of the interesting things is, is looking at, you know, the cyclical nature of our downtown. You can see, you know, starting in January, you've got the, the winter holidays and students come back and people come back. And then we hit the May and our population downtown drops off again. And then students come back in August and we've got football season that pops back up and then back down into winter holidays. Uh, other downtowns, this is, they have similar cycles, but it's not quite as steep. So again, moving to more office space and uh, more residential that's 21 plus will help us move from the academic cycle to a um, more professional cycle. Um, you can see we had started to do really well in 2019, and then the pandemic hit right here and dropped us off a cliff. Um, we worked with the town and asked for a sidewalk expansion for our businesses during the pandemic, and uh, that came in in August. And so you see our numbers start to shoot up again, winter, et cetera, UNC returned to work. and. Um, you can see this last peak over here in April 2nd of uh, 2022 was when everyone rushed Franklin Street and came downtown to watch UNC send off Coach K on his retirement. So the big question is who are these people coming downtown? And one of the things that we can tell is that, um, you know, we don't have as many residents as we would want downtown. Um, we don't have as many employees as we want, and we rely a lot on visitors. So I know Steve shouted out to Lori Palicelli and the work that her Visitors Bureau does, and that's been really important. Um, so we're grateful for them. Um, our placer data lets us break this down even more. So this is a difficult to read slide, so I'm gonna move to something a little more readable in a second, but you can see about, um, three quarters of our groups comes from um, these categories. These categories are created by Experian, the credit rating company, and they break them down into these demographics through a program called Mosaic. And uh, through that, we can under have a better understanding of broad groups of um, demographic and kind of psychographic uh, categories of who's coming downtown. So almost over a quarter of our visitors are power elite, which are uh, 
40 to 50 year olds making a significant amount of money with a significant um, spending power. Um, then of course we've got singles and starters, which are pulling in from a lot from the university, but we also have flourishing families, which again are well-off families that live nearby, um, booming with confidence or um, baby boomers that are financially well set and living in or near downtown. And then um, smaller chunks of suburban style of young city solos. Uh, we're gonna use this data to help us uh, recruit the types of retail and restaurant businesses that we want so that we can demonstrate the possibility for businesses here so they can make um, better um, business decisions. Um, chains have the ability to pull this data, whereas our local small businesses don't. So we hope to fill that gap and to help our um, local small businesses with better data along these lines. Matt, I'm gonna give you a one minute warning. I thought I was rushing. Okay, well, I'm almost done. Um, we here are our, uh, what an example of the information that we can give to business as to who these people are. Um, so we're doing, doing pretty good here. And that was it. Um, oh, you did yeah. great. So, so while some of you have moved your screen away and are Googling, what are you? Are you a bourgeois melting pot? The names of those are absolutely fabulous. They are not created by Matt Gladick. So if any of them offended you, he is simply reporting to you the psychographic terminology. Uh, Matt, will you remind folks, when it said visitors, uh, I would count as a visitor. It is someone not living in the downtown. That definition of that huge visitor number was just a non downtown resident is that accurate? yes it is someone who does not work or does not live within those boundaries i showed you at the top of the slide deck uh, they may be from tennessee but they may also be from northern chatham or hillsborough they could be from the north side neighborhood just outside of downtown and be a visitor if they don't live within that tight boundary that is very helpful i love the data that you are collecting and sharing and i know you're just getting into how best to put it to use. We're gonna come back to you in a minute with some questions, but we're gonna move on. Thank you, Matt, to Carborough. It is, some of you have gotten a chance to meet John Hartman Brown in person, but others of you have only met him uh, this way. I'll say he is as delightful in person as he is in presenting on Zoom. He has been with Carborough for about two years now. Came to us from Elizabethton in East Tennessee, where he was the planning director and the economic development director for that town. He's got more than 10 years of experience recruiting businesses, redeveloping old industrial properties, revitalizing downtowns, as well as focusing on economic development strategies uh, that really focus on entrepreneurship and small business development. Really appreciate the work he's been doing with BIPOC-owned businesses and focusing on that in Carborough. We are glad to have his passion for sustainable economies. Carborough is glad to have him. So John Hartman Brown, feel free uh, to give your presentation. Thanks, Aaron. And um, unlike Matt and Dwight, I do not have any tattoos. Um, so, uh, uh, this is going to be now a theme. If you ever presented a chamber thing again, just be prepared to confess or to be called out. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to go get one for the next for the next presentation. Well, uh, Carborough would be happy to help. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and I want to thank the chamber for uh, letting me be here and uh, uh, tell you a little bit about what's going on at Carborough. All right, let's see. there we go. So first, I want to start out by just uh, doing a little bit of reflecting um, to talk about what some of the what are some of the things we've accomplished this last year. Um, so we've distributed, uh, thankfully, with uh, the help of the ARPA funds that the town has received, we've distributed over three hundred twenty-five thousand um, dollars to small businesses in the form of grants for uh, COVID relief. And um, so those funds have already went out the door. Uh, we did that, uh, got all those applications last fall and distributed them uh, the funding earlier this year. So uh, glad that that's uh, uh, able to help our, our small businesses. Um, we've also hosted uh, some entrepreneurship and small business training. Uh, we had 17 entrepreneurs and business, small businesses uh, attend that training. And we were happy to report that 13 of those entrepreneurs uh, and business owners were uh, business owners or entrepreneurs of color. So uh, that's a, a big focus that we've been looking at is how do we help grow our uh, BIPOC business uh, community here in Carborough. So we're happy to see uh, folks 
really interested in uh, participating in these programs. Um, and we've also completed a downtown parking study. Uh, many of you may have heard about the, the study and the council will be taking a look, closer look at that uh, here this fall. So jumping right in, I uh, just wanna go over a few of the, the main projects, commercial projects that we've uh, seen in the town. Uh, Lloyd Farm has been on your radar for years at this point, uh, probably close to a decade, I guess. Um, and a um, uh, little, little update where we are here. Of course, the development review has been completed, site plan has been approved, um, and construction plans for phase one have been submitted. Uh, and we are in the process of reviewing those. Um, we are waiting on some resubmissions. Um, the next step for this project is construction. I do want to note, however, um, that uh, Harris Teeter is the uh, main anchor to this development. And um, they're really kind of the, uh, their development company is the one doing the, the development of the entire uh, center. So there's been some uh, a pause on uh, any resubmissions or continued work on this. Uh, due to economic uncertainty right now and uh, uh, construction co co increase in construction costs. Um, the, the project is still planned, uh, it's still on the table for um, construction, uh, but we've just had a, a slight delay uh, right now. And I really want to hit on in my presentation today about why these projects are important. Um, and, and this one especially is uh, a significant for our community, primarily because uh, it will help increase uh, the town's property tax uh, a lot and will really help balance out the commercial uh, tax burden uh, versus the residential tax burden. Uh, an update on South Green. Um, phase one and phase two construction have been completed. If you haven't been by there, check it out. Um, some uh, uh, great uh, restaurants there, um, brewery, and we just welcomed a new uh, veterinary clinic uh, this summer uh, to South Green as well. Uh, phase three has been, they've kind of stepped back and are re-looking at some alternative concept designs for that. It's more of a live work option possibly than uh, a commercial, uh, uh, solely a commercial development. So uh, we could see that back lot uh, develop a little bit differently than what was originally proposed. Um, so we're working with the developer to do a complete review of the new phase three concept. Um, and so again, why this project is significant, um, it's already impacting our property tax, uh, but again, it's another, um, at full development, we'll see continued uh, improvement and increases in the commercial tax base for the town versus the residential tax base. 201 North Greensboro, which, which was formerly known as the CVS lot. Uh, the site plan was approved earlier this year. Uh, the CUP has been uh, approved, site plan approved. Uh, right now we're waiting on the construction plans to be submitted for the site. Um, and next step after uh, those plans are reviewed and approved will be construction. Um, so as you can see, that it's going to be a three-story structure, um, retail on the first floor and office on the second and third floor. And again, this represents a, a, a great opportunity for interest in private investment in downtown. And I think that's a big thing for any of our communities. Um, anytime we, we want to see uh, the private sector coming and investing in our communities, and this is a great representation of that right in the core of Carborough. Um, Again, much like the other projects, it of course helps with our uh, commercial residential tax base. Um, and of, of course, right now the lot's vacant. Uh, and so this project um, will really uh, help revitalize that corner uh, and prevents a better, better utilization of the property than the vacant lot that's currently there. Um, also wanna talk about the Club Nova expansion. Um, the site plan, of course, for this project was approved in 2020. Um, it's currently under construction and almost completed. So if you haven't been by there in a while, drive by and check it out um, right on Main Street. The uh, next step for this is grand opening. So um, we're excited about that uh, opportunity. And again, this increases uh, density within the core. While it is a nonprofit, it will not 
specifically contribute to the uh, tax base uh, of the town, um, but it does increase the density within our, our core area. And again, we're, we're continuing to see that uh, investment within downtown, which is uh, an interest in investment in downtown, which is going to be key as we continue to move forward and grow um, and look and re uh, envision what downtown Carborough can be. Um, and the 203 project, um, many of you are, are well aware of this project as well. Um, the site plan was approved uh, in 2020 by council. Uh, the final design review was completed earlier this year. Um, the new parking deck uh, that will be adjacent to this uh, will hold 173 uh, spaces. Uh, of course, it's gonna be home to the Orange County Public Library as well as um, some town uh, offices as well. Um, construction has begun already, believe it or not. Um, major construction has been, however, due, delayed due to some underground utility uh, concerns and issues that are being worked through right now. Um, just a heads up, we do anticipate that the parking lot uh, will be fully closed off. It's currently partially closed. We're trying to keep that lot open as long as possible to uh, provide parking to businesses within that area until we can uh, get the underground utility issues taken care of. Um, so we, but we do anticipate that that lot will be closing in the near future. Um, and then once construction, uh, 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 major construction starts, uh, we'll be anticipating uh, a grand opening. Um, and significant on this project is really, this is the, the largest public investment uh, that, that the town has seen uh, in decades. So the town has not really built any new kind of uh, buildings uh, in, in, in uh, recent history. So the, uh, this, will, this is a substantial improvement uh, to, to the view of South Greensboro Street um, and will also be a great opportunity to help bring folks downtown. And again, really signal to the private sector that uh, we're investing in our downtown and we are asking you to do the same. Also wanna mention, um, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't bring up the Arts Center, which is at the other end of Roberson. Uh, I did not include them in my presentation, uh, but re realized that this morning that um, this is gonna kind of create uh, a great bookend uh, with uh, the 203 project on this end of Roberson and then the Arts Center on the other end of Roberson. So we celebrated them last week with their groundbreaking. Um, so if you haven't seen that, uh, drive by and take a look at the the new temporary sign they've got out there. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing that continued investment in downtown, uh, as well as the Arts Center saying right in the center of downtown. So uh, one of the, the big things that we really accomplished this year as a town was adopting our comprehensive plan. And so with that economic development, of course, was a, a major component of that plan. And so these were the four major goals that came out of um, out of that comprehensive plan that really targets uh, economic development. And so it really speaks to a lot of what the strategic work we started doing shortly after I, I came in, which was focusing on um, uh, increasing um, equity within our economic development programs um, and looking at how do we create more um, equitable and, and, and businesses of, of color. Uh, as well as uh, growing our uh, tourism and arts and entertainment sector as well. Um, and so these, these goals are, are easily reflected here, as you can see. Uh, we're also working on um, making sure that we have sustainable development, that the development that we see both with infill and new development um, is uh, something that's gonna be sustainable for the long term. And of course, uh, encouraging a transition from an economy that is uh, based off of green uh, uh, technologies and uh, low impact uh, industries. Uh, just a few items of interest here coming up uh, in the near future, something to keep your eye on. Uh, the comprehensive plan actually calls for us to con conduct a small area plan for downtown. Uh, so that's something that we're looking forward to doing. And I'll, I'll tie that in with the redevelopment analysis in downtown as well, because small area plan will really help us um, realize where we need to focus uh, for looking at downtown 
redevelopment and parcel consolidation so that we can uh, have big enough sites to uh, really look at uh, uh, creating a more uh, sustainable downtown. Uh, we're also looking forward to parking changes. As I mentioned earlier, the parking study was completed. And so council will be looking at uh, making some changes there. We're also revamping the revolving loan program and that will be coming out uh, this fall to make it more equitable and easier for folks to take advantage of. So with that, thank you for your time today. And um, I'll be more than happy, Aaron, to take any questions. Perfect, John, that was excellent. Um, great to see those projects moving along and to get those updates. Um, John will hang around. We're gonna do 10 more minutes of presentation and then that'll leave us 10, 12 minutes of Q&A. I'm excited to introduce our fifth and final presenter. This is Shannon Campbell. She is the Planning and Economic Development Manager for the Town of Hillsborough. Shannon's been with the town for seven years and she's demonstrated her values um, of collaboration and creativity and determination. That is how I and uh, the Chamber has observed her work. And we are grateful for her partnership as she works to make Hillsboro this great place to visit and live and work and do business. And as a previous mayor said, it's not just historic Hillsboro, it's happening Hillsboro. She previously worked for the city of Raleigh, the town of Morrisville, and we're glad to have her uh, working closer to where she lives here in Orange County. Shannon, can you please share with us what's going on in Hillsborough? Sure, thank you for that introduction, Erin. I appreciate it. Um, let's see if I can do my screen share. Can you see that? It looks great. Perfect. <laughs> I haven't done one of these in a while. We've been kind of back to in-person. So um, hi, uh, everyone. Um, it's great to be included. I know uh, sometimes we forget about little old Hillsborough up in the north end of the county, but we are part of Orange County and we are excited to be. Um, we have really enjoyed our collaborations um, over the last few years with uh, Orange County, with the Chapel Hill Chamber. Um, I think we've developed a great relationship and we have become chamber members as the town and, and I really think we've seen great benefit from that. So for anyone who's on the call who's not a chamber member, I encourage you to look into that and explore that because it's a, it's a great partnership and opportunity for you. Um, so up in Hillsboro, uh, we're a little bit different being that we're a much smaller town, but we do have some basic but very intentional economic development strategies that we employ. Uh, we do try to be very intentional about being a small town and supporting our small and entrepreneurial business development and our business community. Um, we are here to help with whatever our small businesses may need. We want to, um, you know, attract people looking for their first home or a new home and also make it easy to do business in town. We um, try to help people avoid red tape help people get through processes, not get hung up in building permit or development review. Um, so we're there, you know, no one in Hillsboro is, is too busy or, or too important to help. So we're, we're right there. For the things that we can't, um, can't necessarily help with, we do rely on our partners um, at Durham Tech Small Business Center. They're a great resource. Um, so, so we're glad to have that partnership as well. Um, we also encourage smart growth and collaborative public and private development opportunities. So we really want to work with developers to see how we can achieve our goals together. Um, if a developer comes in and they want to build, you know, just multifamily, we try and work with them to see, okay, well, can you incorporate affordable housing? Can you incorporate commercial? Is it possible to do some type of a mixed use project, depending on the location and if it makes sense, um, to try and be collaborative? And, and we also employ a lot of planning and zoning tools to do that. And then we also continue to grow our tourism program and engage a lot in placemaking in Hillsboro. Placemaking is really important. Um, we're economic developers, but we're also community builders. So we're not just kind of creating these little um, multifaceted wealth generating ecosystems. We're also trying to create a sense of community up in Hillsboro. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some projects that I'm really excited about, but I'm going to uh, kind of address the elephant in the room, which is the question that I get very often, which is what's going on with Daniel Boone? Um, and so for that, I don't have a great answer. Um, DR Horton did acquire the Daniel Boone property along with the Collins Ridge project, which is a large residential project behind it. 
Um, so right now that project is kind of in limbo, but we hope to see some movement there soon. Um, that is a commercial project. I know there's been some rumors about the DR Horton's gonna build houses there, which is not the case. At least they haven't approached the town um, about that yet. We do have um, kind of an exciting mixed use project that um, just got approved for rezoning. It's the Morin Tract. It's at the intersection of Old 86 and Cates Creek Parkway. Um, it's a 60 acre tract. They're planning on doing some mixed use housing, uh, residential apartments, townhomes, and also there um, is about 19 acres of commercial development there. Um, we are going to get an Aldi in Hillsboro, which is probably not super exciting for bigger municipalities, but having another grocery store option is nice for a small town. Um, so we're excited about that. And there's also highlighted in pink, we do have some um, land, it, we kind of refer to it as the Pali Oris tract, but we do have some undeveloped land still at that um, NC86, I-85 interchange. Um, there's some challenges with topo and traffic and things like that, but nothing that we can't engineer solutions to. So we're excited to see what happens with the rest of that tract. Um, smaller projects, we do have 100 South Churton Street planning to be opening as our second co-working space downtown, which is really nice to have that option. We have C3 right now, um, but depending on when you stop by there, they may or may not have um, openings for available co-working space. So we're excited for that secondary option. Of course, you can always, you know, park at Cup of Joe or Weaver Street, but that's not ideal if you need a, a kind of a permanent home for, for co-working. Uh, we also have a new brewery slated to open later this year. It's down near the Eno Arts Mill, which the Orange County um, Arts Commission opened, which has been great for economic development down in the West End. Um, and that's going to be uh, Eno River Brewery. So we're excited about that project. And on the public investment side, we are working on updating our comprehensive plan. We're doing a comprehensive sustainability plan um, that's gonna touch land use, affordable housing, connectivity, utilities, and a lot more. Um, some of you may have been asked to participate on some small focus groups for that, but um, look, for, look to the future, more on that to come. Um, I think that that will help us shape the next kind of 10, 20 years in Hillsboro. Um, we are also underway on design for our train station, which I know we've been talking about for a long time, but now that's becoming more of a reality. The train station is going to have meeting space, um, potential space for future park and ride, and eventually train passengers, which is really great, um, both for economic development and tourism. And for context, I tried to kind of overlay the site plan of Collins Ridge. Um, you'll see Collins Ridge here. This is the Daniel Boone property, and then this is the train station property. And to connect all of these things, we are also working on feasibility study for a new greenway. We've seen a lot of positive economic impacts um, with the Riverwalk Greenway and improved connectivity east-west. So now we're trying to recreate that north-south by constructing a greenway from downtown down past the future train station site through Collins Ridge and to Cates Creek Park on the south end. And on the tourism side, I talked a little bit about placemaking. We have done a handful of murals over the last few years. We participated um, in the Joint River Park Arch Project, which really creates a nice archway and entrance into River Park there um, near Weaver Street. Um, the tourism program is supporting a new music festival that's starting out in the county. We're hoping to see that grow and flourish over the years. And we're encouraging people to eat, stay before, after the festival in town. And then we're working on um, a couple of potential upcoming mural projects. And that's all I had. Hopefully I ran through that. And that's time. fabulous. Chen, can you, on that um, train station, that's the higher speed rail corridor that's supposed to take is it from Charlotte to DC is that the route that folks that you're the stop on yes I think it's the Carolina star I can't remember the name of that but yeah we're we don't have arrangements yet with Amtrak for passenger service um so the way that a lot of these train stations work it's kind of like if you build it they'll consider you to come <laughs> so we're hopeful um we're in those negotiations right now but the train station is kind of going to be the anchor. We own about a little over 20 acres over there. The train station only takes up two or three. So we'll likely in the future be looking at public-private partnerships for the rest of the development of that area for a transit-oriented development. Folks may remember or, or not, Hillsborough has a very unique feature. They have a special meals tax. You have a 1% prepared meals tax on meals 
prepared and served in Hillsborough only. And you're using that to fund some of your arts and downtown work. Is that true? Yes, yes, we are. Um, we help, we use that money to fund our uh, nonprofit partners that run historic sites, which serve as attractions, museums, um, and things like that. And we also use that, that funding to do placemaking projects and just create more attractions. Um, on the tourism end, we have seen about 106% recovery um, from 2019. So we've really seen a lot of people coming back to Hillsborough for visitation and tourism. Um, now the challenge in the hospitality market, which I think everyone is seeing, is just trying to find enough workers to feed those people that want to sit down and eat. So. Perfect. Ori, can you spotlight our presenters and we'll bring them into a small group here and uh, by preview to the presenters, I'm going to ask y'all just a few questions. Please also post some questions in the chat. And actually, y'all, if you're like, God, I really like these presenters. I wish I could spend more time with John Hartman Brown or with Shannon or with Matt. I'll invite folks to join the inner city visit. Uh, all of these uh, panelists will be uh, participating in the inner city visit. We're taking 70 community leaders to Asheville, North Carolina to take a look at economic development, downtown development and workforce development and innovation. We'll stop in Winston-Salem and look at wet lab. We have 15 elected officials planning to come, 18 government, municipal staff, civic, social, religious, business leaders. And there's a few more slots available. We'd love to have registration uh, by the end of the weekend. I think we said October 1st, and there is some scholarship funds available, uh, but take a look, Katie dropped a link. Um, we'd love to have you join us um, and help uh, collaborate with these folks. So on the optimistic side, let me ask, um, and would you grab Dwight Bassett also, please, Ori? Um, what are you all most optimistic about? Like when you are excited about the future, in your community, what is that? I'm gonna go Matt Gladick first and then John Hartman Brown. Uh, I am most excited and optimistic about the partnership that we've had with the town and university and what that means for the future. Um, you know, Doug Rothwell working with downtown together and Mayor Hemminger um, and her support for our ARPA funds and for taking over Franklin Street and just really investing in downtown making sure the development we have is top notch. I'm really excited for what that means for the future. Okay, John, and then Shannon. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, the completion of our comprehensive plan really called out a lot of what we need in uh, downtown. So we need, a, we need a better comprehensive plan. We haven't clearly identified our downtown boundaries. Um, uh, I think, you know, that will help guide us for what redevelopment in downtown will look like. Uh, I think as we, we, we recognize we want more density in downtown. We want downtown to be more walkable and bikeable, um, but we need the density to match that goal as well. So uh, I'm excited for, for uh, what, the, what that small area plan will, will help us identify. And then Steve, and then while Dwight is not spotlighted, he is available and I'm gonna go to him in a minute with that too. Shannon? I think I'm most excited about um, our comprehensive planning process. I think that it's going to identify a lot of opportunities for us to operate better in Hillsboro. I think that um, we're implementing right now a planned unit development zoning district that we've really needed a conditional master plan in fill zoning district that we haven't had previously. Um, so I think the implementation of that, and then I think the comprehensive plan is probably going to make a lot of recommendations on land use, future land use, and also current zoning that, I, that we're going to need to implement that I think is going to make development in Hillsborough uh, just a smoother process and more transparent, both for our elected officials and for our developers. So I'm excited to see the, the fruits of that labor and what kind of interesting and creative development projects we get in the future. Steve, what are you most excited about? I'm more than excited. I'm passionate, Aaron, to see that we are now receiving more and better jobs of, of all types, salary levels uh, for Orange County residents. Uh, the, the lowest salaries that are being offered by the newest companies coming here, and I'm talking about distribution, is $20 an hour and higher. Uh, but all of these uh, careers uh, offer full-time positions, healthcare benefit and other employee benefits, uh, even distribution and certainly the advanced manufacturing companies uh, like ABB, for example, uh, require 
technical training. And so that creates a, a path that, that individuals uh, maybe can move away from two and three part-time jobs with no benefits into uh, a career, move into a uh, Durham technical uh, curriculum uh, and, and the path up in that regard. Fabulous. And Dwight um, may be there and can jump in any time he'd like. What um, questions to y'all in the audience? Welcome to post. Um, Desiree has made a comment um, about housing and jobs. We are seeing job growth and job growth is outpacing housing growth. I think we have 10,000 more jobs in Orange County than we do have um, for people living in Orange, places for people to live in Orange County. Um, let me ask y'all then, uh, if I'm not seeing a direct question uh, to you, is if you could wish something different that would make uh, doing economic development in your community easier, what would that be? If you could wish it different, something would change. It could be local, it could be not, that would make um, economic development more successful or easier. Do you have one? Unmute yourself if you do. Matt, you are unmuted, so I'm going to you first. Is there something you would wish different? Uh, I'm really appreciative of the efforts to improve our planning processes and permit processes, and I'm hopeful for the complete community's plan to continue that work and identifying low-hanging fruit to make it easier for uh, good development to move forward. Anybody else want to put into the universe your request? Uh, there's also elected officials here, and you can pretend you're telling it to me if you feel it's inappropriate to tell them directly. So tell you tell me <laughs> what the thing is you would wish to be different. Anything? Yeah, I'll, huh? I'll chime in. I, I don't know that there's something that's uh, unfortunately I don't think you know changeable uh, too much, but uh, you know Dwight kind of alluded to it earlier with you know, our current layouts of our communities are, are can be a real challenge. In a car borough, we have narrow roads, we narrow rights of ways, um, suburban kind of this one story, big parking lot development. And that makes it hard sometimes for us to go in and redevelop these sites because they're just not big enough or they're too constrained um, for the traffic volume. Uh, and so, you know, I think, uh, you know, if I had one wish to throw into the universe and magically change overnight, <laughs> you know, that would kind of be one for me. Excellent. And our just final three minutes before we do some concluding comments, I'm gonna ask y'all if there's one thing you wanted everybody to remember, if there's just one key takeaway about what's going on in the area for which you are responsible, you might want the people on this uh, participating in the panel to share um, or to know a key takeaway. Um, what would that be? Oh, and uh, while you think about that, <laughs> uh, I can't see the hands, but I'm told Mayor Pam Heminger has a question with her hand up. Mayor Heminger, do you wanna I just, make a comment? Yep, yeah, thank you. I just had my hand up because you asked what things we I wish could be different. I, yes, wish, we could, I wish we could move past our uh, reputation for being difficult. I think we've done a lot in the last several years to change towards a better outcome for our community in many ways. Um, we've learned through our housing study reports or all our economic um, studies or all the partnerships we put together that we can change and make a difference and go in the right direction. But it's really hard to get people past the reputation of what was. And so I know what can be for our community. I'm very excited about what can be and the path we're on. We are going to become a life sciences hub for not just the region, but for the nation. And we have a lot of productivity along to show that we're actually on that path, but we need more middle housing. We need more young people um, above the student and college age living, young professionals in our communities to make it work. We have to have that balance and we have to create the housing that goes along with that. And we are working on this complete communities, um, which has been a fabulous experience. So we're doing it differently. We're gonna get better outcomes, but only if people are, are willing to let go of the bad reputations in many areas so that we can Agreed move forward. <laughs> and that is something that we all can do. There's, we're almost hundred people are on this call. We can tell that story outside of here. When someone's like, I hear it's hard to do business in some play, you say, that's not true. We're actually in incredible activities going on uh, in our community. Let's help change that story. 
uh, people misremember us. They had an experience 10 or 15 years ago and it just isn't that way anymore. So final comments around the horn and Katie's gonna close us out. And for those that can stay, we're probably gonna run a minute or two over. But any final conclusion, a thing that you'd want everybody to know or remember in like in 15, 30 seconds. Dwight Bassett, would you like to go first for us? So uh, I would just like to tell everybody that they can go to www.Chapel Hill Complete Community if you'd like to know more about the initiative that the mayor was just talking about. We're excited about that work and feel like it's a, a, a new day for us. We're pretty excited about downtown together. And we believe that in a few years, we're going to look back and say, wow, we've, not, we've turned another corner and think that's pretty exciting. Fabulous. Going to Steve and then Matt and Shannon. We know that growth in Durham and Wake County uh, is what it is. We know that we have the Greensboro, Winston-Salem growth to our west. And then now we're seeing what Chatham County is doing uh, with their uh, new announcements there with the semiconductor company, the electric EV car company, the new housing there. So growth is all around. And, and today we're talking about growth coming to Orange County in, in our three towns. But what I want to say is that the, the rural nature of Orange County uh, is not in jeopardy of, of going away, uh, even with any of this growth. 84% uh, of Orange County's acreage uh, by land use planning is essentially off limits for water and sewer connection and development. Uh, another 13% of Orange County is comprised of our three towns, and we know what our three towns are. Uh, and so we're really uh, only talking about 3% remaining uh, that the county has in the economic development districts, only 3% of the acreage in Orange County. And so my, my closing comment is that even though there is growth occurring all around us and within our community, we're still going to be preserving this, this uh, scenic uh, rural nature of Orange County. Thanks, Steve. Matt, Shannon? Uh, I'll be quick. I, I think that, um, you know, Steve's right, the growth is coming. And I think that um, the best uh, planning metaphor ever given to me is that we know that it's going to rain and we get to choose how we plan for where we're going to direct the rain. And I think this is a really great opportunity with the plans coming forward to make sure that we're creating walkable and livable communities that we can all be proud of versus shunting off growth and having it be where the easiest and the lowest hanging fruit is. I think we need to make the right moves and I think we're doing that. Excellent. Shannon and John, final word, and then to Katie. Yeah, um, well, to answer your first question about uh, like if we had a magic wand, what would make my job easier is unlimited water and sewer. But since I don't have that, <laughs> um, we do, you know, kind of harping on everyone else, we, we do, the growth is coming and we do need to be kind of intentional about what we approve and where and making sure that we're embracing some additional density, some mixed use, the, you know, people want to live, work and, and grocery shop kind of all in the same area. So kind of not everybody wants, I know this is hard to hear, but not everyone wants to live in a large lot subdivision. We do have to have other housing opportunities for other people. And in order to have an inclusive community, we need mixed housing and we also need the commercial to support that. So that would be what I would like for people to take away. Perfect, John Hartman Brown, Katie Lewis. Yeah, uh, ditto what everybody else said, but I, I would also say, you know, when we're looking at, all of our objectives and goals, especially our climate action goals that we all are, are striving towards, you know, uh, all that growth, we got to put it in, in our towns. We've got to put it right in the center. And that sometimes means that, you know, that means we're going to have to go up an extra story. That means we're going to have to, um, you know, make our communities more walkable and bikeable uh, and put people closer to um, where they want to live and work and shop and play. So, um, Fabulous. Y'all, John, Dwight, Matt, Steve, Shannon, we're grateful for the partnership with y'all and your presentations today. Katie Lewis, take us out. All right. Well, um, I thought that was terrific today. And I hope everyone on the, the Zoom you, that you feel like you captured some really great insights that'll be useful for you going forward. Um, I want to give a hearty thank you to our speakers who took the time to prepare excellent presentations and also to Aaron for uh, moderating this discussion. And of course, I want to thank our sponsors who made today possible uh, and the whole series possible, including Chapel Hill Media Group, Duke Energy, uh, Durham Tech, Service. 
Grub Pro and Grub Properties and SBTDC. As I mentioned at the start of the meeting, we will send you the link to this video and the slides. Just give us a day or two to get that all squared away. Um, and in the meantime, make sure you mark your calendar. Our next forum is going to be the Legislative Forum on December 8th. As always, if you'd like to learn more about our chamber and become a member, please reach out to us or go to carolinachamber.org. And with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.